Welcome back to another video on the channel. So before I get underway, I um, apologise for this video being out a little bit later than expected. I've started a new full-time job early this week, so being a little bit hectic, uh, but still can't wait for this train up to get underway on Monday. We'll still be bringing out lots of video during the tournament, probably not doing daily coverage as I have done of the Grand Slams in the past, but still be watching as much of the Australian Open as I can and bring out lots of videos. So I'm just going to jump straight into my Australian Open preview for the women's tournament. Always fantastic Grand Slams. WTA is littered with lots of quality players, particularly lots of young players as well, so it's very exciting. Grand Slam is always wide open, as we saw last year, with the likes of Barbara Krejcikova and Emma Raducanu coming through to win their maiden Grand Slam titles. So I'm just going to talk through eight players who I think are title contenders and give you a profile on those players. So starting off with Victoria Azarenka, who obviously won this title back in 2012 and 13. There are only two Grand Slam titles that she's won. She's 32 year old now, but won 20 hardcore titles. So I think she's a, a huge threat at any Grand Slam uh, hardcore event. The positive stick for your Victoria Azarenka. She's got a very strong mindset, um, capable of overturning matches. She's a real battler. Um, knows when to take risks and switch momentum. And I think she's a player that, you know, she's never down out in a match. She's won Grand Slam. She's won from tough positions. And with the age that she is, she brings a hell of a lot of experience to the court, similar to Angelique Kerber, who also started to pick up form at the back end of 2021. For me, as a ranker, the key to her game and her success, she has to be aggressive. You know, the forehand's very extended. She gets great depth. She attacks the net with ruthless conviction. And she's capable of beating anyone in the right, right mood. You know, she can she can mix with the very, very best players. Fast hard courts really suit her. If she can find the forehand and the backhands down the line, she's very difficult to pass at the net. And I think she's got a good chance of making a decent one next week in Melbourne. I think to execute and maintain that confidence to be aggressive, uh, as a ranking must serve and return excellently, but she is capable of doing that. In terms of some weaknesses for her, the second serve isn't great. Um, slow spin speed often gets punished, certainly off the best returners in the world, the likes of Asaka and Barty. She rarely uses the backhand slice. Um, it's obviously effective to gain the advantage against the other big ball strikers. The likes of Barty and Halep have more weapons and variations. The likes of Von Jibur can take pace off the ball with that backhand slice. Um, as the ranker doesn't have that weapon, but what she doesn't have in that weapon she makes up with the power and the forehand and the serve and movement again is not amongst the best players in the world she needs to dictate play first strike tennis be confident hit the lines um, otherwise long exchanges do favor other players moving on now to the next pair and this is a player that i'm a huge huge fan of and i'm tipped multiple times the channel for a huge future and that's elena rybikina still just 22 years old has just won the one hardcore title yet to make an impact at this tournament. But in my opinion, she's a future three top player and a future major champion. And when you look at the WTA, look at the young players, the likes of Coco Goff, Bianca Andrescu to come back, Iga Svantec, Emirado Kanu, Leila Fernandez, Elena Rybikina, the future of this sport is in such good hands. And Rybikina is a player with unbelievable, unbelievable natural talent. You know, the timing, the ground speed, the power, the ball seems to fly off the strings with very little effort. Uh, makes the game look incredibly easy, and we all know it's not. Um, at six foot, she's got a fantastic serve. I still don't think it's as good as it could be. Uh, she's a young player, still relatively unexperienced in the WTA. She's climbing the ranking slowly but surely, uh, but I think it could become one of the best serves on the WTA with a little bit touching up and practice. On the verge, in my opinion, of becoming a huge breakthrough star. I think if you can get one tournament win or a win of the likes of an Asaka or a Barty de Grand Slam to really give her that experience and just knowing in her mind that she can mix it and beat the top players at the major events, then I think she could be on the route to a fantastic career. Some negatives towards Rybikina, things she can learn on. I think a game does need nurturing in parts, you know, sometimes overly aggressive needs patience added variety to a game but when you've got ground strokes as good as what Rybikina has you can't blame her for trying to take the ball on the rise early and finish points as i'm going to mention ashley barty again um she can keep the ball very low she splits up the speeds bring her into the net Rybikina likes to take the ball early on the rise and other than that she doesn't really have many weapons so if she can 
nurture a game, become a little bit more patient, attack the right ball and add some variations to her game, then I think she's going to be a huge threat to everyone in future years. She didn't reach a final in 2021, which is a little bit disappointing on her part. It doesn't suggest that she's going to have a storm in 2022. Um, but when you look at the likes of Amber Kanu and Barbara Krejcikova, you wouldn't have said that either last year. So anything can really happen in the WTA. And I think we've seen enough potential in Ryder Keener to suggest she could break through and challenge for a major title. Moving on to Amber Kanu, um, as we all know by now, unbelievable story. Qualified as the US Open main draw um, through three qualifying stages and then won the tournament without dropping a single set. As you can see, they won one hardcore title and that was the US Open. Never actually played the Australian Open. Um, and yeah, what a story. Um, some pros there for Amaru Kanu. Her return is probably her biggest weapon, in my opinion. The natural anticipation redirects pace so well and that's very very important on these quick hard courts if you're facing a big server like an Osaka uh, like a Muguruza Sabalenka if you can redirect that server it certainly puts you on top in rallies and that's something Radu Kanu done very very well in the US um, whoever was serving against almost became a negative uh, because she's that good of a returner particularly the backhand cross court again her backhand down the line um, an ability a shot that not many players have the ability to play uh, Raducanu seems to be at home and it's a shot that she's been at the play from being a very, very young teenager, 15, 16 year old. She already had that shot pretty much perfected on the grass and you're starting to see that now um, on the major scene. She's very quick, athletic youth. She delivers on the big stage, handled the pressure of the US Open final and semi-finals and quarters very, very well. Um, a different kind of pressure now that she's a Grand Slam champion, uh, but one I'm sure she'll take in a stride. And also, she's got no points to defend. Obviously, Wimbledon was her first tournament at the WTA, which is in July. First six, of the month, first six months of 2022, she's got zero points to defend. So it's almost like a free hit, although there will be obvious outside pressures um, given her US Open win. Some cons, she hasn't served well all this year. Uh, second serve, certainly an issue. Got dominated off right bikini of the day, serving far too many double faults, looked a little bit confused at why she was serving so badly um that's something that does need to try and be touched and brushed up before the australian open where she will be severely punished uh the pressure and the expectation we're yet to see how that'll impact her career but undoubtedly people will sadly jump on the bandwagon of negativity if radu Kano does start to have a poor run of form I've spoke many times about this. Radu Kanu's in a transitional period. She's got a new coach. It's a very, very young. She's got next to no experience at WTA. So she does need to be afforded a couple of years, in my opinion, to find the feet on the tour, get used to the full time traveling, get used to the new coach, Torben Belts, and his methods. And then we need to judge Radu Kanu in a couple of years' time. The bounce factor, can she go on from that US Open win? Um, a lot of players speak that once you've won a Grand Slam title, it's very hard to get yourself up for the next couple of years. Um, you've almost touched gold already at such a young age. Radu Kanu is very grounded. She speaks incredibly well. And I think she's got a huge future in this sport, um, but maybe he's not winning the Grand Slam title for at least a couple of years, in my opinion. Moving on to Coco Goff and... Koto Goff for me is still the best prospect on the WTA. I'm not shooting Colorado Kano a prospect anymore now that she's won a Grand Slam title. But it mad to me that Koto Goff's still 17 years old. I feel like she's been around for years and years. I know she'd come through when she was 15, but it feels like she should be about 20 by now. Um, has just won the one hardcore title. Obviously had a fantastic run in the fourth round of the 2020 Australian Open, which is 15, beating Venus Williams and Naomi Osaka. Or was Osaka the next year might have been. Um, now, I think with Coco Goff, she's got less pressure on her, which might sound ridiculous to some, but when you've had the emergence of Emirato Kanu winning the US Open final, Leila Fernandez reaching that US Open final, obviously a teenager from Canada, there's sort of less pressure. I think Goff was sort of carrying the teenage WTA on her back. Uh, for a couple of years, especially coming through at 15 years old. Uh, being an American, everyone tipped it to be the next Serena and Venus Williams. But there's less pressure on her now due to the emergence of those two youngsters and also Igish Fiontek, um, which might just release you know, some of the pressure on Goff shoulders, uh, which might see improved performances. She performs in the big stage. She beat Osaka. It was in 2020. I thought it was. Um, 
similar to Radu Kanu, the fitness, the speed, the athleticism is a huge advantage on hard court, and them two have got that in abundance. She's got a superb backhand, and um, the cross court is a very difficult shot. She plays that so well. She's very aggressive off the backhand side, um, and for her technique, for her age, is incredible to watch, and she's going to go on to be, I think, a huge, huge name in the sport. She's ever improving. I think Goff's a player that works very, very hard off court. Um, I know she's grown. She's, as I said, came through 15 when she was still a teenager. Um, but she looks physically very, very strong in Australia, I felt. Um, a huge difference to what shape she was in at the back in 2021. Um, so it's clear to see that she's working hard off court, which is good to see. Cons for her, a second serve are an issue. Uh, it's lots of double folds, but very, very young. Lots of time to improve on that. The forehand, in my opinion, is certainly improving, but could still get better over time. Um, but you can't forget she is still 17 years old. And I also feel with Goff, she does sometimes fall into the trap of trying to become a counter-puncher too often. I think she's got very heavy ground strokes that are underrated. Um, and But I think with conviction and confidence over time, wins against top 10 players, she will transform into a star. But she's, you've got to remember she's still a very, very young player. Moving on, Iga Svantec, uh, who I mentioned there, just 20 years old, obviously won a Grand Slam title back in 2020 French Open um, at a young age without dropping a single set. It's becoming an occurrence in WTA, which is crazy. Um, Svantec, in my opinion, just a mental beast. I've never seen any young player, a teenager, have such mental strength like Svantec's got. Um, studies the sport, analyses the numbers, like set routine, she's a winner machine in the big moments um, and just crazy good for her age. She's got one of the best backhands on the WTA. For me, it's Fiontech's balance. Um, she's got a very strong build. She really pushes heavy off the back foot um, with that exception of balance, cross-court or down the line, she can nail either shot. Major win experience. Um, she has the potential to be a multiple Grand Slam champion. She looks fantastic on the hard courts. Um, obviously won that title on the clear courts and she doesn't look too bad on the grass either um, so she's a player that can play across all four, all three surfaces which is very rare um, I think as a young player on a day I think Sean Tex is ridiculously good uh, but can she perform the Australian Open wheel sharp find out Last week, I watched it against Ashley Bartley and in Australia. It was a fantastic match, but I think Bartley just had the edge because of that variety. Um, Bartley was switching up the pace, forcing Svantec wide, keeping the ball low, keeping Svantec deep. And that ultimately was the difference. I don't think Svantec played bad, but you didn't quite have the variety to match Bartley and the weapons to upset Bartley's rhythm. She didn't pass the second week of any major in 2021. Disappointing on her part, I'm sure she'll have been downhearted with the performances after the 2020 that she had um, but she'll certainly be putting pressure on herself to do better this year I don't think there's really any obvious negatives in Shrontek's game uh, consistently great balance and racket speed so I'm expecting a big tournament and 2022 from her now moving on to Garbina Muguruza and the top three players 28 years old now, has won an impressive eight hardcore titles, two Grand Slam titles being the French Open and Wimbledon, and reached the final of this tournament back in 2020 before losing to America's Sophia Kennan. With Muguruza, she's got a very good record in this tournament um, in the recent years. As I said there, she reached its final in 2020. She had match points against Osaka last year in the fourth round, I believe it was, and Osaka went on to win it. She has the game to dominate opponents, particularly in a fast hard court. You know, Muguruza uses that incredible forehand. I've never seen, you know, a WTA very often create the angles that Muguruza does and is capable of doing so. She attacks the net with real conviction. Um, only the real best players, I think, will beat her. The ones that can keep Muguruza off that forehand can keep Muguruza deep on the run behind the baseline, which is not at the strongest. Um, unless you can do that, then I think Muguruth is going to overpower and dominate most players with first strike tennis. Um, last year, she won the WTA finals. She's back inside the world's top three. So after a couple of difficult years in 2018 and 19, she's definitely back to her best and a huge danger. 
Just some negatives there for Muguruza. She hasn't won a slam since 2017. Uh, she's sort of fallen behind Asaka and Barty in the pecking order in recent years due to them winning grand slams in her not. And I do worry whether she's got a lack of belief at times, you know, when things start going wrong. She does sort of come, go into her shell, become a little bit erratic. Uh, tactics go strange. She can throw in some very poor matches, uh, which is obviously at risk of an early exit. She suffered a couple of those uh, over the past few years at Grand Slams. And now I think she quickly gets out of bad energy. And it's exactly what she had to do in 2018 and 19. You can see her getting down to self, really uh, self-reflecting, really imploding on court. I think now she stays grounded, um, uses her weapons to full effect and stays positive on court, which is important, especially when you've got a game style like Muguruza's. Moving on to the top two, in my opinion, in the draw, Naomi Osaka, who has got a quite incredible Grand Slam record. You can say that she's won seven hardcore titles for them at Grand Slams, won this tournament twice, won the US Open twice. She, in my opinion, on full floor, is the best hardcore player in the world by a long, long way. Um, just a serial winner. She's won majors at times as well as these, in my opinion. Uh, last year, she served pretty poorly throughout the tournament and still won it um, comfortably. And she's just got relentless ground stroke. She's an aggressive returner. The forehand, the backhand, either wing is just littered with winners. She paints the lines with a, with real um, power and precision. She's just awesome to watch. She makes the game look so, so easy. Um, effortless timing. And just creates brilliant, brilliant ball speed. Um, the confidence, she knows that she, she hits a stride. It would take an incredible performance to stop her. Um a cycle looks happy. She's focused on tennis. A uh, massive threat to anyone on a hard court. Some very few cons for a cycle, in my opinion, going to this tournament. She has got lack of recent major tournaments. You know, missed the last three Grand Slams of last year with mental health problems. Slight doubt whether she'll, you know, be straight back in a stride and ready to win a Grand Slam. But I can't see it. You know, Osaka is a player that if she plays a few matches, lights up the court, gets the crowd on the side, starts to win his serve well, she's going to be very, very difficult to stop. I will say a serve does need cleaning up. You know, she won it last year without serving very well, as I mentioned. Um, but if that does find a rhythm, then it gives an extra strength to her ball and makes her an even bigger threat to everyone else in the draw. And Osaka is obviously now ranked 13th in the world after missing majority of last season through um suffering those mental health problems but still one of the overwhelming favorites against majority of the players in the draw moving on now to the final preview i'm going to go with ashley barty the world number one uh won the wimbledon title last year has won eight hardcore titles reached the semi-final of the tournament back in 2020 she's undoubtedly the best player in the world at the moment across all three surfaces um you could debate that Asak is better on hard court, but if it goes on clay in grass and consistency, you have to go with Ashley Barty. There's zero negatives in her game, absolutely zero negatives at all. Um, she's just impossible for any opponent to find rhythm due to her variety, switches of speed, execution of different tactics, um, and net player serve. Everything about Ashley Barty just is class, and she's brilliant to watch. Um, not I've not seen many WTA players like Ashley Barty in the past that's got such variety and confidence in what she's doing. The backhand is the best shot in tennis. Uh, the backhand short slice, the double hand, uh, flat down the line. She can play every type of backhand shot. Similar to Novak Djokovic in that sense and just a joy to watch. Um, it serves a rear weapon, as I mentioned there. Cons, there's nothing with the game. As I mentioned there, it seems to be improving in all areas. Just comfortable playing every shot, uh, just about performing to a high level at every tournament. One thing I will mention is a slight negative for Barty, I think, is the pressure and the expectation at a home major, especially being number one. She's definitely the favourite going into this year's tournament. She's never quite produced the absolute best at the strain open. I wouldn't say she's been disappointing and you know, hasn't certainly suffered any first round exits in the last few years. She's been beat off top players in good matches. Um, but she enters this tournament in outstanding form and Australians and the outside world are going to be expecting to go very, very far. So now in terms of predicting my winner, I'm going to go with Naomi Osaka. I just think she's a serial winner on the hard courts. 
I understand she hasn't played many majors last year. The one she did, she won. But I just think when she finds a stride, if she can start serving well, finding the forehand and backhand winners, she's going to be next to no in stoppable in my opinion. Ashley Barty, fantastically consistent, brilliant all-round game. Won a Grand Slam title last year, just won a title in Australia, enters this tournament in fantastic form. It'd be very, very close. I think they're due to meet in the last 16. Whoever wins that tie, in my opinion, will win the tournament. And as an outside shout, I'm going to go with Coco Goff. I think she's improving her all-round game. Her forehand certainly came on a lot in the past 18 months. She looks physically very, very strong. There's a little bit less pressure on her shoulders due to Radu Kanu and Fernandez breaking through in 2021. Um, so I could see Coco Goff making another big run in Melbourne. If you have any of your predictions for what will happen in the WTA draw, do leave them in the comment section below. I uh, hope you enjoy the tournament. I will be bringing out lots of content during it. So if you are interested in that, please do subscribe. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the next video.